Sorry about all the delays. Hello? Okay, you can hear me. Okay, very good. So, so we have talked about approximations in general, then approximation architectures. Uh, remember, the two main issues that we have is how to select the architecture. We have discussed this a little bit. And now, how do you train an architecture after you have selected it? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, approximate policy evaluation methods. Given a certain policy, how do you <coughs> approximate the cost of that policy, the cost vector? One possibility uh, is to select this cost vector by projection. What we have here is this cost vector sitting in a very high dimensional space and we have an approximation subspace defined by a linear architecture. So think of J mu as being a gigantic vector in a gigantic space and this subspace being a lower dimensional one and we want to find an approximation within the lower dimensional space. The most, the, the idea that immediately comes to mind is projection. Define some kind of uh, projection metric, some norm, and project this down from J mu to pi of J mu. Okay? Now solving this pi is a Euclidean uh, norm. We're going to assume, assume it's a Euclidean norm. And Euclidean norms lead to quadratic least squares cost functions. You minimize the sum of the square errors between J mu and its projection. It's a quadratic problem that uh, you may try to solve using data, using some data associated with uh, obtained by with policy mu. So this is a sort of a, a, this comes to mind immediately and let's see how this can be done. How can it be done by simulation? Of course, we can't have the, if we're trying to evaluate the cost of a policy or try to evaluate the optimal cost, it's very difficult to obtain because that's what we're looking for. However, and we can't evaluate the entire vector J mu. What we can do is selectively look at some states and obtain the cost starting from that state. How can we do that? We have a system and uh, suppose we have a simulator for this system. We simulate on the computer and we have a certain policy that again we can simulate. We start at a certain state i and run a lot of trajectories with it. Of course, the system is stochastic and will have a lot of, generate a lot of different, uh, uh, different trajectories, but we can average the corresponding costs and obtain an approximation to the expected cost, starting from the given state and using that policy. In other words, ideally, to evaluate the projection of J mu, we need to solve this least squares problem. Okay, R star is associated with the optimal projector. It minimizes the Euclidean norm error between J mu and the approximation. Xi is a weight that corresponds to the different components. If Xi is a vector of all ones, then you equally weigh the various components. More generally, you can introduce a weight, a weight vector xi, which gives you the, which weighs the different errors with the corresponding values. So that's what ideally, what, the exact projection is obtained by minimizing this, this function here with respect to r. Now, um, the minimization can be done by setting the gradient with respect to r to zero, right? It is, a, it is a standard problem and its solution can be written in closed form. So this is the solution, the exact solution of this projection problem. Okay, you set here, we set the, you create a matrix of derivatives and you invert that matrix and this is the exact expression for the, um, for the, um, for the weight of the projector, R star. Okay, now this seems very simple, but it has two major problems associated with it. The first one 
is that you don't know the exact values of all the JMUs. Remember that this JMU sub i has many, many components, so you can't calculate all of them. The second is that n could be very, very large. So this involves a very large sum of, of numbers and also a very large sum of matrices to involve. So how are you going to calculate this? Remember what I was saying earlier. Simulation comes in handy when you want to calculate approximations to large sums. And if you look at these, because psi is a probability vector, this is an expected value. Okay? So expected value of this with the probabilities of various components i given by the, are these psi i's. This is also an expected value of a matrix. So simulation can be used to approximate these expected values and do low dimensional calculations. In particular, we select some states, we sample the state space, we select states i1 up to ik, and we calculate the costs corresponding to these states by using simulation. Now you can do this exactly or you can do it approximately. For example, if you were to run an infinite number of simulations starting from i1, then you would get the exact value of j mu at i1. This should be 1 here. However, you may approximate this j mu of i1 using only a few simulation samples, maybe 100, maybe 10. Okay? So you generate all these cost samples. You go here, you run the system, get a cost value. Then you run some, go to another state, run some cost, the simulation, get another cost value, and so on. And you collect all of these samples, and you put them together in an approximation of the expected values that go into here. So in place of this expected value, we use a Monte Carlo average. And instead of this expected value, we use a Monte Carlo average. And that gives you an evaluation, an approximate evaluation of the projection where the solution using the simulation-based solution can be viewed as an approximation of the weighting corresponding to the projection. It's a typical example of how you use simulation in this field. Now, this is for the problem. Oh, by the way, let me also mention something else. Instead of, uh, it's also possible to show that, uh, that this, uh, this uh, simulation uh, answer can be obtained by solving a least squares problem, whereby the cost samples, the model for the cost samples is uh, compared with the sample values that you get, and the error is weighted in a least squares objective. This formulation is, the, is equivalent to this. So, the original, the exact problem of projection is a least squares problem like that. The simulation-based version is one whereby you replace exact values by sampled values. Okay, so this is the first method, direct projection of something of interest, like the cost of a policy. Um, it's perfectly viable, simple, but it's not the best method. Um, it is direct uh, projection, but there are also some indirect approximation methods that are better suited for our context. And um, one of them is so-called Galerkin approximation. Uh, Galerkin approximation is an old method that's used very widely in numerical analysis for solving uh, high dimensional equations, like partial differential equations, using lower dimensional approximations. It's designed for this context, approximating high dimensional solutions, solutions of, of, of high dimensional equations. Now in indirect uh, policy evaluation, in Galerkin approximation in particular, instead of projecting the object that you want to approximate, you project the equation that the object solves and you solve the projected equation. So here, the equation is x is j mu equals to t mu j mu. You project this equation, and uh, 
using phi r in place of, uh, of uh, j mu. And you solve this equation in place of the original policy of the Bellman equation. It's a projected form of Bellman's equation. Pi comes in here on the right hand side. And to interpret what this does, whereas here you want to find a phi r onto which j mu projects, here you want to find a phi r such that t mu of phi r projects exactly onto phi r. Okay. Because pi, the projection, involves least squares, again, this is a least squares type of equation, but it's not the same as the one that I had before. Um, there are several methods. The most, uh, the most famous methods within this field for solving, uh, for, for policy evaluation, are of this type, Algarlerkin type. And uh, there's a method called TD lambda, uh, which is a stochastic iterative algorithm for solving this projected equation. There's another method called LSTD lambda. Uh, the lambda parameter, let me not discuss what this is. L TD and LSTD, uh, they, um, they, it, it solves uh, a simulation-based approximation of this equation. I'll say a, a few things about what LSTD really does. Uh, this is a projected equation. If you make a simulation-based approximation to that, and solve the, this approximation, then you get the LSTD method. LSPE method, it's called least squares policy evaluation, is a simulation-based form of projected value iteration. Instead of solving this equation, what it does, it, it considers an iteration involving this equation, and then solves this iteratively by, uh, by, with some form, with some simulation involved. OK, so these are major names of methods in the field. And it's not my intention now to discuss them, but just to give you the thumbnails of where things fall. Um, this Galerkin approximation is a major type of uh, approximation methodology that's based on simulation. OK, now let's go back to the Bellman equation error method, where you minimize the, the square of the error in satisfying Bellman's equation. So within the approximation architecture, you want to find one element that makes this error in satisfying the Bellman equation makes it minimum. The, this is a quadratic objective with a weight, with a vector psi, with a, with a weighted by a distribution psi, uh, which uh, weights differently the different uh, states. Now, this Bellman equation method is actually a Galerkin method. It's just that it uses a different projection norm than the Euclidean, than the standard Euclidean norm. There's a weighted norm of a different kind that makes this a Galerkin method. So everything that you can say about Galerkin methods, you can also say about Bellman equation error methods. And that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting thing. OK. So now, how do we implement this uh, indirect method, this projected equation in, or Bellman error methods using simulation? Again, the idea is to, cut, to generate many random samples of states using the distribution, some distribution psi, either of this norm or, the, or of the norm of the projection. Calculate many samples of transitions using the policy that you're evaluating then form some kind of simulation-based approximation of the optimality condition for the projection problem, or this problem here. And you use sample averages in place of inner products. And then solve this Monte Carlo approximation of the optimality condition to obtain a vector r. Okay. So let me summarize all this again. Indirect methods. Ideally, solve this equation or that equation. And there are simulation-based approximation to these uh, where you pick states. OK, how you pick them is something that we may discuss next week. You pick states, and you generate random transitions from these states. And you obtain, uh, you can, you obtain various uh, 
uh, terms for this error term here, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then you weigh them appropriately, you sum them up, and then you, uh, you form the corresponding, and, and then the corresponding simulation, si simulated equation uh, involves Monte Carlo averages, and you solve that and you obtain a solution. I guess I'm using too many words to explain something very simple. There's something exact. We make a simulation-based approximation to it, to this, to this problem, and we solve the approximate problem. If, if we have one, one recurrent class for this Markov chain, we, we, I think we don't need to generate many random samples. We can have one uh, trajectory and worry for a very long time. And we, can, and, we, and we don't need to choose the distribution at first. We can, we can after the simulation, we can calculate the frequency. Is, is that possible? Yes. You're, yeah, your comment relates with how do we select the random samples. One possibility is to select them arbitrarily, very irregularly. Another possibility is to let the system run using the policy that you're evaluating, and that will take you through and automatically pick the states, pick the simulation states. That's also a possibility, and in fact, has some advantages, some theoretical advantages. However, there are reasons why you may want to add, uh, to make the simulation richer, not just go through the states that the policy takes you, because the policy may have preference for some states, yeah. but may never visit some other states. Yeah. And you want to be able to get a representative okay. and rich enough simulation sample. Yeah. But if we have one recurrent class. Uh, if you have one we, recurrent yeah, class, we, yes. And uh, our policy can, yeah, that, that's enough. In theory, if you have a Markov chain with a single recurrent class, yes, you're right. If you have a single recurrent class, you're guaranteed to visit all states. However, with a fixed policy, with a given policy, some states may be visited far more frequently than others. It may be a very rare event that a state, a particular state, may be visited. And, um, and, and then, uh, in, a, in, a, in practice, that means that it may never be visited. Okay? And, so you may, you may, your approximation may be good in some parts of the state space, but not for others. This is a major problem. The problem of exploration. Make sure that you're getting a representative sample from that policy that samples a lot of states so that you build an approximation that's good enough across the state space and not within a subspace only. Are there any questions here? Okay, so here are the issues for indirect. How do you generate the samples, okay? And also, how do you calculate the R vector, the solution efficiently from the simulation-based approximation? So both of these are major issues. Okay, let's talk about another indirect method. This method is uh, called aggregation. It's an old method that appears in many different fields. Um, you have a large number of states now, many of these states are going to be similar to each other. Okay? Think of a case of states being geographically related. You can think of many examples. Um, the idea is to group many states that are similar, group them together into single group states or aggregate states. So the number of original states may be gigantic, but you introduce only a few groups of states. and. Uh, the idea is to assign a common value of cost to each group. So like a piecewise constant approximation over groups. Solve an aggregate dynamic programming involving the aggregate states to obtain the, the cost associated with the groups and then use a common cost for every state within the group. This is called hard aggregation. And there are many different types of aggregation. It's the simplest type of aggregation. Here's an example of hard aggregation. Here we have nine states, and we introduce groups. One group is this x1, 
it has states 1, 2, 4, and 5, x2, only two states, and so on. And we're going to sort of formulate a problem that operates on the x space as opposed to the i space. We can encode these dependencies, these membership relations within the different aggregate states in this matrix here. This matrix, okay, it has the row dimension is the number of states, it's nine in this particular case. The column dimension is the number of uh, aggregate states, it's four. So you see a one every time as the corresponding state belongs to the corresponding aggregate group, okay? So all of this can be encoded in this matrix phi. And it is possible to generalize this idea. And, uh, and in a more mathematical view, uh, solve a problem of this form involving the current policy, where phi r is an approximation to the, um, to the, the cost of policy mu. Okay, in the case of hard aggregation, what this phi r is, it's a piecewise constant approximation. But generally, if you choose a different matrix phi, and also you choose a matrix D, which is a probability distribution, this type of equation generalizes the hard aggregation idea. Um, you can get some, some intuition about what this phi and D do is that if you consider the original system, if you, if you, um, okay, this is a system involving rows and columns. If you combine different columns, different rows, uh, using a probability distribution D, uh, that, that reduces the row dimension. If you combine different columns using a matrix phi, then you get a smaller column dimension. So in this way, you shrink the dimension of this system, and you obtain a system whose rows and columns are obtained by weighing the rows and columns of the original. This is a more general view of the aggregation idea. And notice that the aggregation equation has a very similar form to the projected equation. In fact, if phi d, phi is a big matrix like this, d is a matrix like that, if that matrix is a projection matrix, then the aggregation method is a special case or a projection method. It turns out, in fact, that hard aggregation can be viewed as a projection method with a special choice of uh, projection uh, uh, metric. OK. Now, aggregation can be generalized a lot, like I said, any matrix phi and any matrix D whose, col whose rows are probability distributions and columns and, and D whose, whose also its, its rows are probability distribution uh, defines an aggregation method. So for example, if this row here were not, did not have a one in the first position and zeros, um, and let's say I had a row of one-fourth, 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 one-fourth. That would mean that state one has, it can be viewed as a member of each one of these groups with probability one-fourth. In other words, the entries of this matrix more generally encode the degree of membership of a state within an aggregate state. It's the same thing, the same kind of interpretation of the rows and columns of D. Let me not go into this, but I just want to tell you that there are many, many different ways of doing aggregation, and this is one way. And there is also an interesting way to view aggregation as problem approximation. The original system is given here at the top. You go from state I to state J with probabilities Pij, and with costs g i of u and j. Now, if you establish a relationship between the original states and aggregate states, and introduce the system here, then you can think of transitions of going from aggregate state to original state, a transition, and back to aggregate state, and define through this 
entries of the matrix D and the matrix phi, define a system involving just the aggregate states. The more complicated system is approximated with a system whose transitions are between aggregate states. Now, it's a little bit complicated context, concept to grasp, and we'll need to discuss more examples. However, the key thing is that if you look at this bottom system, it's a lower dimensional system whose transition probabilities are determined by the transition probabilities of the original and whose cost function is also determined from the, from the, uh, from the cost function of the original system. And these transition probabilities, the, pi, the p hats and the g hats, can be set up so that you solve this lower dimensional problem, an aggregate problem, get the costs for that, the cost of states of this aggregate problem, and then use them to approximate the cost of the states of the original problem. So here are the main elements of this methodology. Solve exactly or approximately this aggregate problem involving aggregate probabilities and aggregate costs. It's possible to do that with any kind of value iteration or policy iteration method including simulation-based methods. You build a simulator that moves from aggregate state to aggregate state using a simulator of the original. And then you use the optimal cost of the aggregate problem, which gives you a value for every state, every aggregate state, to approximate, to make a piecewise or semi-piecewise approximation for the cost of the original problem. Okay. So this is also a problem approximation. The original system where transitions take place between the original states is approximated by another system that involves these aggregate states. And the transitions now are like this, back like this, go up and down. Uh, and any simulator takes advantage of this kind of system. And what you get is an approximation based on this structure. Now one nice thing about aggregation is that you can use the algorithm that you use, the policy iteration algorithm that you use is an approximation for the original problem, but it's an exact algorithm for the aggregate problem. As a result, it behaves more regularly than in the general projection equation approach. The disadvantage of this aggregation approach is that it is kind of restrictive on the approximation architecture that you use because it involves these probability uh, vectors. And uh, where is the projected equation approach uh, can use more general uh, type of approximation architecture. The two major methods for policy evaluation for, for approximation value space and policy evaluation are these projected equation types and aggregation types. So now let me say a few things. Are there any questions, what please? Is, uh, what is the relationship between the, uh, dis between the disaggregation probability and the aggregation probability? What's the relationship? Do they have mathematical? They can be completely unrelated. Uh, completely unrelated. Yeah, they can be completely unrelated. Of course, if there are relations, you get different specific methods. Uh, but the, OK, the disaggregation probabilities are the elements of this matrix D. And the aggregation probabilities are the elements of this matrix phi. So the aggregation probabilities are what you see here in this particular case. And the only requirement is that the rows of phi and d are probability distributions. That's the only requirement. Uh, for different choices, of course, you get particular, interest, particular methods that are interesting. So this hard aggregation, soft aggregation, uh, aggregation with. Yeah, at the least, uh, we should guarantee some data uh, are reachable. Uh, we can. Uh, oh, yeah, it's the, the theory, OK, so what, what you're saying is how do we choose phi and d? That's the, that's the question. And the answer is by intuition, to a great extent. Um, uh, you, can, you can look at error bounds. There are error bounds that are associated with this methodology. But when it all comes down to application, it's really intuition.
uh, how, what makes sense from an intuitive point of view as an aggregate state. And that's, uh, if you have a particular problem, like a queuing problem, for example, uh, you, can, you can think of good aggregate states pretty easily. I mean, one aggregate state is when the system is nearly empty. If it has zero customers, one customer, two, let's say up to five, okay? That's one aggregate state. Another aggregate state when it's mid-loaded. Another state when it's in the heavy loading phase. Okay, that's, so you can take a system, you can take a queue that has many, many states and, and, and reduce it down to four or five aggregate states. That would be an example of intuition. And similarly, if you have a queuing network, for example, that might be. OK, so we're not doing very well with time, with all the delays. So I have a few more slides. And uh, let me cover the first, uh, let me cover a few rather quickly. Um, OK, so we covered issues of approximate policy evaluation. Now, policy iteration has two phases, policy evaluation and policy improvement. Uh, the policy evaluation the questions actually are quite easy. The, um, it's the policy improvement questions that are, 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 are harder, in fact. Um, OK, so what's the theoretical basis for approximate policy duration? I mentioned last time. Suppose that you do the policy evaluation approximately within delta, and you do the policy improvement also approximately within epsilon. Could be that epsilon is equal to 0. Then there's an error bound. The sequence of policies that you generate come within this bound of the optimal. So what this says that is that eventually you're going to get cost functions of policies that are within a zone of the optimum of this size. Typically, the way these methods behave in practice is that you make steady progress up to a point. You may start with a bad policy that has a cost that's high. And then, like the next iteration, you may get something that's better and better and better up to the point where you get within this zone close to the optimum. And then you typically may oscillate within that zone. The oscillations are quite unpredictable. It's very hard to tell what's going to happen. It may be that there are no oscillations at all. Aggregation methods actually do not have any oscillations at all. They, they terminate somewhere within that zone. However, projected equation methods typically lead to oscillations. And there are some very discouraging examples of oscillations that have been constructed, where you don't get good performance at all. The method gets stuck into a bad oscillation. Um, in practice, people have not, have not seemed to worry very much about oscillations far from the optimum, because this bound is kind of loose here, OK? It's a, it's a gigantic number. If alpha is very close to 1, this is a huge number. But people don't seem to worry about that. The practical studies that people do, the case studies that people do, they do not seem to report any substantial problems with oscillations. And there are some arguments about this. But in any case, there is a, you may read about some very bad examples of oscillations and with fairly simple systems. OK, so this is the theoretical basis. Now, here's an, uh, 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 here's an issue that came up just a little while ago with your question having to do with exploration. Uh, how do you construct simulation samples for a given policy? A given policy. Uh, has a tendency to go to some states, perhaps, but not to others. So if we generate the cost samples using that policy, this biases the simulation by underrepresenting states that are unlikely to occur under this policy. As a result, the cost estimates for the underrepresented states may be highly inaccurate. We form a least squares objective involving simulation samples if the simulation samples do not do not represent some states, then there is nothing in our optimization, least squares optimization, that will, provide, that will provide an incentive for good cost approximation of these states. So if you have an inaccurate, um, inaccurate uh, cost approximation for some states, when you do policy improvement, this may give you nonsense for the improved policy. 
a serious problem. In fact, the most serious problem from a practical point of view is how to construct a rich enough simulation sample to sim a rich enough set of samples to, to make sure that the state space is sufficiently well explored. <coughs> so this is known as inadequate exploration. Uh, if you have a deterministic system or if you have a nearly deterministic system, then it's a very acute problem because a deterministic policy will not randomize at all between states. It will just go along a single trajectory. And as a result, the, um, the, some states will never be visited if you just follow this policy, if you just follow single trajectories of this, of this policy. What you need is to, is to create a more, uh, artificially create a, a rich sample by introducing uh, states and transitions that uh, do not, are not associated with that policy. So there are some remedies that we're going to discuss later. Uh, restart the simulation and ensure that the initial states uh, form a rich and representative subset. Uh, occasionally generate transitions that use a randomly selected control rather than the one that's dictated by the policy. There are also other methods that use two Markov chains, one for selecting, generating states and the other is to generate state transitions. And all of, this is, all of these are very important topics for research within this field. Okay, um, we have been talking about, gen, uh, about approximating cost functions. However, if you get this approximation, then the policy improvement requires a model, knowledge of the transition probabilities for all the controls. And uh, if instead we approximate Q factors, then we don't need a model. That's the advantage of Q factors. I mentioned that earlier. And it is possible to use a parametric approximation for Q factors, which would, be, would have features of both state and control and weigh them with corresponding weights R. Any method that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, projected equations, aggregation, Bellman error, and so on, can be adapted to, adapted to work with Q factors rather than states. The reason is that there is a, there is a system whose state, are, state costs are the Q factors. You may construct a Markov chain that has states not the states I of the original, but state control pairs. Define transition probabilities between state control pairs to other state control pairs as dictated by the policy. And you can apply all these methods I gave earlier to this other system that involves uh, a state, the state control pairs. So we can talk about the cost function approximation and everything applies to, to Q factor approximation, uh, the methods transfer through. On the other hand, with Q factors for a given policy, exploration is a bigger concern because from a state IU, the only kind of state that you can get to is a state that, in, this would be J here, by the way, is states where the control is the one assigned by the policy at J. So from IU, you cannot go to many states. You can only go to fewer states, only a subset of states. And these, there's a problem of exploration. OK. So let's take a five minute break. And then I have two or three more slides, and then we'll finish. Um, some general issues on, uh, on, on, on this approximation methodology. You may also think of some questions. I'm sorry I had to rush a little bit uh, in the last part of this lecture.
Okay, let me turn on this mic. Hello? Okay, there we are. Okay, some genetic issues that uh, do not fit into what I've discussed so far, but they are important. One has to do with, um, with uh, algorithms that use simulation. Um, remember that what we were interested in is solving some linear systems of equation using sampling. Like the linear system of equation that we solve is the evaluation equation, the Bellman equation for a given policy. This is a linear system. And it's generally of this type, x equals b plus ax. x is not to be confused with a state. x is the variable of this generic linear system. Okay? Uh, so any linear system can be written into this form. a is a square matrix here, and b is a vector. And we want to find the vector x that solves this equation. We can do it by matrix inversion. But many people use simulation to solve such systems in specific contexts. Suppose that we don't have access to A and B, okay? A and B is, uh, is something that, uh, that can be calculated only approximately within some sampling error. Instead, what you have is simulation samples of B and A. So B is observed M times with error WK, and A is observed K M times with, with, uh, with error WK. And WK and capital WK are random. They're just the simulation noise. So all we have is these simulation samples. And we want to solve approximately this system of equations. What kind of methods are there for doing so? Well, uh, we have the particular context in mind where this is the system is the approximate value is, is the is the policy evaluation system, either the projected equation or the aggregated equa ag aggregation equations. Now, there are two kinds of methods. One is called stochastic approximation. It's a stochastic iterative algorithm whereby you start with a certain vector x0, some guess of the solution, and then you use the current sample, OK, of evaluate the sample version of the right-hand side of this equation. Okay, the sampled B and the sampled A multiplied with XK. That gives you sort of a direction to go. However, because this term is random, you should not go too far. You should some, use some kind of a step size, gamma K. Now, this step size should be diminishing, actually, in order to average the effect of randomness here. Typically, gamma K is taken to be proportional to 1 over K, okay, something like that. And you, you form the you, xk plus 1 is xk plus gamma k times the error between the sample, the sampled, the sample, the error in the sampled uh, version of the equation, the sampling, OK, this quantity minus xk. Now, this is a very old methodology. It dates to the 50s. It has a very strong theory. People still working on it. And it, it's one possibility within our context, stochastic approximation. Another possibility is to use these samples of B and A to construct Monte Carlo averages. Okay? This is uh, the Monte Carlo average of the samples of B. Okay? And this is the Monte Carlo average of the sample of A. This is some vector BM and AM. And then you form an approximate sampling equation where the samples are replacing uh, the, uh, the sample averages are replacing the true quantities. And then once you have this equation, you solve it either by matrix inversion or you solve it iteratively by using some kind of iteration. Both of these methods are important within our context. I mentioned earlier this method of TD lambda and Q learning. TD lambda and Q learning are examples of this approach here. Okay? You collect samples and you make iterations of either um, R values, weight values, or J va or Q values, uh, Q factors. In Q learning, X is a Q factor vector, and we actually 
don't iterate on the entire vector, but we iterate one state control component at a time. It's an asynchronous version of this stochastic approximation. That's what Q-learning will turn out to be. TD lambda operates in TD lambda. The x vector here is the r vector, the vector of weights. It operates on weights using uh, samples in a, an iteration that is a special case of this form. However, there are other methods. I mentioned LSTD and LSPE. They are of the second type. You collect the samples, you form averages of the matrix and vector that's involved in the evaluation equation, and then you use matrix inversion for this one or iterations for this one. That's a fundamental division, two different kinds of methods, and both of them are useful within our context. And um, they allow you to solve linear equations where the, compo the, the, the data of the equation is unknown and can only be approximated by simulation. So we will come back to this type of methods, but I'm giving you now an overview of where they fit. The second topic I want to mention is that uh, is whether we should be approximating costs, whether it's a good idea to approximate cost functions. Should we approximate cost functions or something different? Uh, there is an argument that says that we should approximate cost function differences. In other words, not the cost at a given state x, but rather the difference between the costs at two different states. Why do we want to do that? Well, suppose that we are at a state x and we want to compare two controls, u and u prime, in policy improvement. Then we should minimize expected value of g plus alpha j mu. But to evaluate the two controls, we should evaluate this quantity and subtract out of this quantity. And the answer depends on the sign of this. Okay? So what enters into this sign is the cost difference, not the cost values. In other words, if I take a cost approximation and I raise everything by a gigantic amount, I'm going to get exactly the same new policy. The policy improvement operation does not, involve, does not depend on a cost constant shift of the, of the function that you approximate. Therefore, it is cost function differences that are important, not costs themselves. Okay? Look at this expression. It's the Bellman equation expression for u and the Bellman equation expression for u prime, where x bar and x bar prime are the next states corresponding to u and u prime. So this cost function difference is what's the important thing. And, uh, and uh, of course, it's possible to evaluate cost function difference by approximating separately this, approximating separately that, and take the difference. But the difference is subject to noise, OK? You're subtracting two quantities that involve noise you're likely to get garbage if the two quantities are similar to each other. It's a serious concern. Now, everything that I've said about approximating costs also appro applies to approximating cost differences. Instead of calculating an approximation to this, I can calculate an approximation to d mu corresponding to two different states. And the reason is very simple. If you, the, the, the cost difference function satisfies a Bellman equation. And is a Bellman equation corresponding to a system that has a states, pairs of states of original system. In particular, d mu, the cost function difference, satisfies this equation where the one stage cost is the difference of one stage cost that comes in here, plus alpha times the difference of uh, costs at the next states. X bar is the next state starting from X and giving policy mu. X bar prime corresponds to the next state starting from X prime. So if I view X, X prime as the state of a new system, and use as cost function this, then the Bellman equation for that system satisfies this equation and gives you the cost function differences. <laughs>
So everything I said before about direct approximation, direct approximation, projected equations, aggregated equations, Bellman error applies to this system as well. And that's a way, this is called differential training. And it is, uh, you, can, you can learn d of m, d of mu uh, with, uh, with the standard methods. Now let me show you an example where cost function differences are important. I mentioned earlier in the, my previous lecture that when it comes to continuous time optimal control, it's the gradient of the cost to go function that's important and not the cost to go function. Because the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation involves the gradient of J, not J. And here's an example. Um, this is a very simple, it comes from a very simple optimal control problem, continuous time optimal control problem. You have a differential equation that's the simplest that you can think of. X dot equals U, okay? X is the state, is a scalar, and it evolves according to this equation. U is the control. And um, one way to address this, this problem is to discretize the time, okay? So we've talked about discretization. So let's discretize. I have a typo here. This should not be xk, it should be uk, okay? I'm sorry, okay? There's a typo here. Instead of xk, it should be uk. So this is the delta discretization of this differential equation. And within a delta discretization interval, the cost is quadratic. Let's take a quadratic cost. Delta is the increment, the time increment, multiplying the value of the quadratic. So now, let's consider a policy. And let me take a, just a, some policy. Uh, it's a minus 2 sub x. It's a stabilizing policy. It's, it's as good as any other policy to try uh, to evaluate. I've taken this particular policy because this example is done in more detail in the, in the textbook. So I've chosen this particular numbers. OK, so now if you calculate this cost function, its exact cost function, it has this form. It is quadratic. It involves delta, okay? It is, um, it is, um, okay, it involves delta because, uh, because delta comes into the dynamics here. And to first order, it is quadratic in the state and linear in delta, and it also has some second order terms that are negligible. So for small delta, it's the first term here. The Q factor associated with Q, if you can calculate it, it has this form here. Now, the Q factor involves a term in the state, a term and another term that, that, that is negligible when delta is small. And the control part is this one here, and it's proportional to delta. So if you are at state x and consider applying U, the Q factor involves a big term in the state and a small term in the control. Small because it's weighted by delta. So it's a quadratic function with a little perturbation on top of it. Now suppose you approximate this quadratic function. The approximation is going to try to match itself to this first term. It's going to treat this as noise, negligible noise. Least squares methods tend to mimic the coarse behavior of the function that's approximated and little variations are being washed out in any least squares minimization. So if you try to apply TD lambda, Q learning, whatever, with approximation, then the important part of this Q factor is going to be washed up completely. For comparing policies at state x, it's only this last term that's significant. That part is constant. It's only the part that depends on U, and it's delta dependent. So you may be approximating something that's big, and the important part may be a small variation on that, but the approximation does not capture that at all. People who work in approximate, in adaptive dynamic programming, in uh, approximate, approximate dynamic programming with continuous time systems, are well aware of this problem. And, uh, they do not, use, uh, do not use the standard methods in the same way uh, 
that people who work on artificial intelligence do. Okay. And the reason is precisely this. That you should be approximating, in some context, differences of cost-to-go values and not cost-to-go values. Are there some questions on this or the previous part? Okay, it's late. I'm sorry that this has been sort of a, a, a little bit uh, rough session with all the difficulties in getting the projector to work and all that. And uh, we'll meet again on Monday, and we'll go into more specifics. <laughs>